Okay, here we're going to look at a brief overview of the male and female reproductive systems. So starting with male and female, we're looking at how is sex determined. Well, in mammals, sex is determined early in embryonic development. Early on, embryo gonads are indifferent, neither male or female. The presence of a Y chromosome will convert the gonads into testes, defining a male. And we see that here, where the female gametes are two Xs, males are an X and a Y, the Y is important for converting um, the gonads into testes. Even though there's not many genes encoded on the Y chromosome, that's one very important, and that's a defining characteristic of males. We see the size comparison of the Y to the X chromosome. However, in some animals, for example reptiles, the sex of the offspring is temperature dependent. We see in these graphs here, and also this nice representation. This example here, if the temperature is cool or very warm, the offspring here will be dominantly male. If the temperature happens to be in the middle of these two ranges, in this case, these eggs will be predominantly female in nature. That's very important. In alligators, you'll have an entire nest be either male or female. And depending on the organism, uh, the temperature ranges, it can influence the percentage of males that will hatch from these eggs. Uh, now looking at, we're going to look at some of the specifics. So if you're unfamiliar with uh, meiosis, you might want to review this slide here. Keep in mind that we're starting with a diploid cell, and we're resulting in haploid cells in the end. And there's a meiosis 1 and a meiosis 2 that does occur. So you may want to review this slide just to refresh yourself with this process. Looking now at the male reproductive organs. The testes produce sperm and testosterone, and they're enclosed in a hanging sac called the scrotum. The key part here is the reason why they're located externally in the body is sperm need cooler temperature to develop. So we see here for males trying to conceive, males are typically um, suggested not to wear tight underwear or skinny jeans. They're instead su suggested to favor boxer shorts and loose pants. What this allows to have happen is the scrotum and the testes to hang outside the body and remain at a cooler temperature. This cooler than body temperature will increase the survival of the sperm and therefore increase the chance of conception. That's spermatogenesis, the formation of the sperm actually in the testes. Keep in mind we're starting with this diploid cell and ultimately we're going to be producing four viable sperm cells. This gives you a little bit of the details of what the sperms will look like, but I'm not going to focus on this too much in this lecture series. This is only a brief overview. Now the female reproductive organs uh, we're looking at the ovaries being the primary female reproductive organ. This is uh, female gametes, or the ova. They secrete the female sex hormones, estrogen and pro progesterone. Uh, we can see here the ovary and the fallopian tubes in the uterus. This is important for fertilization. If you ever heard the term uh, caviar, uh, this is basically fish eggs. And this is this collection from sturgeon, which is a very rare and delicacy and very expensive. Uh, this is just a collection of those female eggs that are unfertilized. Now looking at the events to generate these eggs, what's interesting is that before birth, uh, female eggs will be arrested or paused in prophase one. So if you're confused what prophase one is, you might want to go back and review the meiosis review slide. Secondary oocyte arrest in metaphase two and is ovulated. If they're penetrated by a sperm, Secondary oocytes completes meiosis II, yielding in one large ovum, which is the functional gamete, and a tiny second pol polar body. So there's this sequence of events that occurs before the sperm may enter the egg and then after the sperm may enter the egg. Now we're having this kind of uh, primary oocyte and this breakdown in these polar bodies. Uh, this is very different in comparison to the formation of the sperm as we saw earlier. Now providing a direct example of the two, Ogenesis, we're starting with that diploid cell, ultimately producing only one viable ovum. These small polar bodies, while haploid, are not really functional. Primary um, spermatocyte, we're having that 2N diploid, produce four viable sperm in the end. Uh, so it's important that for every diploid cell, we're producing those four viable sperm, versus in oogenesis, we're only producing one viable ovum. Now the ovary and the formation of an ovum. At birth, female ovaries contain all the oocytes she'll ever produce. So at birth, every female has all the eggs they'll ever have. It's about two million oocytes, and they're arrested or paused in prophase one of the first mitotic division. 
Mature egg cells are called ova, or single ovum, and this cycle is repeated about every 28 days while one is released. But um, at birth, which is kind of hard to, to um, think about, about 2 million oocytes are present in every female, and those are the eggs she'll have with her for her entire life. Now the fertilization process occurs um, when the egg is in the fallopian tubes here, and a sperm will meet that egg, and only one sperm is allowed to penetrate the oocyte. The fertilized egg will now be called a zygote. It's transported ultimately to the uterus, and this transportation process may take about five to seven days to reach the uterus. It'll attach to the wall, and this is where the zygote will then form into the fetus and develop into a baby. It's important to remember that fertilization, fertilization can only occur in the fallopian tubes. By the time it reaches the uterus at this point, it'll attach to the wall if it is fertilized, and the baby will develop from there. Hopefully this gives you a brief overview and a little bit more of the detail of male and female reproductive systems.